Hello and welcome to episode two of season four of the Music Works podcast. I'm Katie Beardsworth, director and founder of Polyphony Arts, and today I'm delighted to welcome soprano and music entrepreneur Eleanor Bowers Jolly to the Music Works studio. Ellie studied music at Royal Holloway, University of London, the University of East Anglia, and went on to specialist vocal training at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. As well as her own singing career, she has wide experience as a chorus manager, fixer, panellist and adjudicator. She specialises in advising singers on the audition process, helping them choose their targets and repertoire, how to present themselves and generally guiding them through the audition process. We are also delighted to announce that Ellie has now joined Polyphony Arts as a specialist opera consultant. And I can't sign off on this impressive list of accomplishments without mentioning that she is also a co-director of the Come and Sing Company with Tom Appleton, and together they're working on an exciting programme of productions of Noise Flood for 2023. But first, here's a message from our sponsor. Music Works is generously supported by Allianz Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Allianz offer a team of music experts who understand musicians' needs and lifestyles, especially helpful during the strange times we're in. You can get cover for all types of instruments and musical equipment with protection against accidental damage, loss, theft and more. And, unlike home insurance, there's no excess to pay on instrument or accessory claims. At the moment, Allianz have a special online offer with two months free cover. Not only that, every Alliance music policy now includes free legal assistance and support so you can protect yourself both as a musician and in your personal life. Find out more at alliancemusic.co.uk. Alliance, serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. So now let's go over to the Music Works studio where Ellie is waiting to speak to us. Uh, welcome, Ellie. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. So today I am joined by Eleanor Bowers Jolly, and um, Eleanor is a freelance um, opera consultant working with Polyphony Arts as of very recently, which is very exciting. Welcome to the team. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very excited about getting involved. Absolutely. And so um, Ellie's background is you are, of course, an opera singer and um, freelance singer, and you've been on many audition panels. Um, so you're here today to share with us the inside track on um, what singers need to think about when they're preparing to audition for the for the various types of work um, the auditioning for. So this is your um, behind the scenes um, information about um are we going to talk about opera auditions only or all auditions talk about all auditions i've been on either side of many many <laughs> different types of auditions um both on the panel um as a chorus manager um and a fixer and um on the other side as a uh, an opera singer and consort singer so yeah i've i've been on both sides of the coin which i think is quite useful to have <laughs> That is useful. So obviously, um, depending on who's listening to this, if you're an experienced auditioner, you will hear some stuff that you already know. But I think there's going to be something for everyone in this in terms of, um, you know, how to deal with the very many tricky corners that auditioning brings up. Sure. So where do you want to start? Mm, where do we want to start? Well, I think what we've got to think about, first of all, is the companies that you're auditioning for and the groups that you're auditioning for, you need to do some research on. And the research that you need to do is things like repertoire that they've been doing over the past seasons. I often found that when um, when I had uh, singers coming in front of me for a certain opera company that will remain nameless, um, I ended up um, hearing repertoire being performed that was really irrelevant to the to what the company was had done and what the company was planning to do for the next few seasons so do your background work I've also had things like um countertenors coming to audition for productions that have no countertenors in the uh, in the production at all so you're coming to sing to me and actually you know it's most of both your and my time because at present I'm not thinking that I need that type of voice within my um within my company mm. 
So really do your research. Look back over past seasons. Look forward. Try and find information about what the productions are going to be in the following seasons and pick repertoire that is relevant to that to those 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 uh, shows so making sure that you're really on the ball and have shown that you do your research and it's like if you say to somebody a numerous times they've said so do you know what this company um what our ethos is what we want to do what we're trying to do whether it's early music whether it's modern music whether it's um not very well known opera um if i say to you so what do you know about x company i need i want to know that you've done your work and done your background um mm. really, really important yeah that's really interesting i think a conundrum that a lot of people have when they're choosing repertoire is um is the decision between do are, are the are the panel sick of hearing the same things over and over again and do they want to hear something different or um, actually, do you want to hear something that you're super familiar with, either from, from an opera that's coming up or that has just been? So you're saying it's definitely coming down on the... I would say, I, would, I mean, we do get to hear, you get to hear the same things over and over and over again. What you've got to really think about is, yeah, you may be comfortable with that piece that you're singing, but is it showing your voice off to the best of its ability? Are you choosing repertoire that maybe you should be singing in three or four years time when you're slightly older? Are you singing repertoire that actually, you know, you should have maybe left behind and moved on? So um, mm -hmm. we get things like, um, like, um, lots of Mozart arias, which is great, but we get lots of Carabino. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Lovely aria doesn't show me what your voice can do. It's very much in the middle range of the voice. There's no mm -hmm. real high sections. There's no real legato sections. There's no um, lower ranges to show how your voice is tied together from bottom to top. It's very middle range. Now I'm going to want to see more than that from you. So if you're going to bring that, then I need you to bring something that completely contrasts and shows me something completely different. So there's quite a lot to go into the melting pot of repertoire choices. And isn't there? Because there's what the company is looking for and also what shows off your voice and your ability and your kind of career stage and ideal roles. Yeah. Um, we do have a lot of people. I wonder it's a tricky uh, decision. I've, I've had a lot of people singing arias that I've been like, no, you're not quite ready for that yet. You can, mm. I'm not quite ready for that. I, I can see it happening, but I want to see it when it's in your voice. You know, I want to yeah. I want to hear an aria that is in your voice and shows me what you've got right now. Because you yeah. may perform for a chorus audition now, but in three or four years' time of chorus experience, you may be going for a principal role. That's when you bring out those big guns. And that's mm. when you show them exactly what you're ready for at that point. You need to make sure that you are really showing you at your best at this point in your career. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, have you got any tips on how to on how to measure that? I haven't, I haven't prepared you for this question. I think I find this really tricky as in terms of like, you know, because obviously within the scope of trying to work out what's really good for a voice and what shows off well and also what the panel are going to want to hear, you also have your own artistic preferences, don't you? So you might actually um, you might actually hate Carabino, but it might be the perfect thing for you at that moment. So <laughs> a scenario like that, if you don't like it, you won't sing it well. That's the yeah, this is true. truth. If you don't like it, it won't show you off. So yeah. um, it's that's quite a simple one. The harder mm. one of this decision is whether it's right for you to be seeing that right now. And if you have a good teacher and a good coach, then you'll mm. be led in the right direction. I've made a mistake before where I've made a choice in an audition that was the wrong choice for me at that wrong point. And I didn't get the job because I was singing the wrong kind of repertoire for me at that age. It was just completely mm. wrong. And so you kind of go, mm, OK, maybe I should have utilised my... Uh, the people who know better than me <laughs> more than I did you know I didn't know best at that point take the guidance accept the guidance and if they feel like if you feel like they're someone's holding you back just trust in them because I'm you know these people have so much experience and so much time um doing what you've done now previously that they've got the knowledge to advise you in the right way absolutely mm. Yeah, pick that's really I always do pick everybody's brains that you can, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And see different, and sometimes see different coaches as well. For instance, I've I've um, been doing a gig every year in Monte Carlo, Clang, um, 
doing a messiah, <laughs> doing a messiah so out there for kind of like the last five years obviously the last year we couldn't do it because of covid which is gutting but every mm-hmm. year i would take it to the coach that i had at that point and we would look at something look and find something different to bring out in that work because you know it, it, you need to still breathe life into whatever you're singing so i've had a year off and my coach how rude has moved so yes. i have now <laughs> I, I have now just contacted someone that i really um I, whose opinion I really value to see if I can have some coaching with him to bring it another breath of life into that work and into that mm. and another and another mindset another kind of way of looking at my performance not necessarily technically but how I understand what I'm performing and that's another huge thing understand every single word of what you're singing understand the context of everything you're singing because We've all done this in the past. I've done it in the past too. And someone said, so what does that mean? And I'm like, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> I, you know, do that research too. You have to know where you are. And you'd be surprised how many people think they'll get away without doing it. Mm. We, can, we can tell you don't know a word. We can tell, <laughs> you know, so really do that preparation as well and see different people to breathe different life into it. I don't mean technically, because your technician that you work with is going to be your technician. I mean, when it comes to artistic approach and emotional approach and characterization, and then you can mm. bring different elements of what they are offering you and build your own view of the character and that will shine through. Yeah, absolutely. That's great advice. Um, so what's so what's next then? We were going to talk about CVs, weren't we? This is kind of going back, yeah. Where, <laughs> around the time the time of making the repertoire choice, there's also the CD, uh, the CV, the CD, the CV. Um, <laughs> matter. Yeah. A four page, please. No more. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Boom. I've had seven page, seven page CVs. Um, mm. You're like flicking through and going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I hold a clean I hold a clean driving license. Um yeah. I'm a keen horse rider. Don't care. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoy I enjoy crochet on the weekends. Don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. I want to know where you've studied, where you've sung, what conductors you've sung under, what repertoire you have um and that's it you know i want to know education and experience and yeah. you know your fach and be very solid in your fach i know it's hard sometimes but you also hear baritones that should be singing tenor and tenors that should be singing baritone and we have mezzo singing who should be singing soprano that happens all the time but when you present yourself don't present yourself as not knowing where you sit yeah um yeah in knowing where you are and, and 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 knowing where your voice works you know mm-hmm. so that's a really important thing but yeah the cvs wise i've had some buttes that are just one page picture at the top contact information i don't need to know your height i don't need to know your weight i don't care i don't care what you look like i care what you sound like you know mm-hmm. and if it fits apart then that's great um and i want yeah i want uh education but i don't want like your gcse's all i want is your musical relevant musically relevant education from degree level up um and then i want uh opera roles when sung where sung chorus where sung under who and any and a few bits of consort work if you've done that too because i value i value very much people who have sung within consorts because they are very musically in tune and intelligent not saying that opera singers are because i'm one of them too you know but um <laughs> but i know that like you have to work on a different level with concert work unfortunately concert work can sometimes um reduce the uh, make, make you feel very kind of stuck in a box with what your voice can do and then that can be a negative when you're going into opera because you need to free it all up again but People like me and people like people I've set on panels with know that that's the case, and we want to hear, uh, we want to know that you've done that, so we know that you've you've worked in a choral kind of way, and also know how to blend. So mm. it's a real, it's a real tricky kind of balance that goes on. Yeah, that is tricky. But actually, I mean, in general, I would tend to say within the scope of not giving people reams of un, um, 
un uh, irrelevant information um that obviously if something isn't on your cv then the people reading it are never going to know that it's there so if it's musical yeah. and it shows something about you musically then yeah. it's worth having on there because yeah. um well i want to know what languages you are what you can mm. do and play any other instruments um mm. that kind of thing um so yeah it's got to say I, I wish i could show you an example but unfortunately <laughs> Um, but it was <laughs> fantastic just to have that one page, all that relevant information and your languages on my desk, job done. And I can see from that, I can, I can learn so much from that information that, um, I don't need to know anything else. Then I just need to hear you and see you and kind of, um, assess you as a, as a singer and as a character. Mm -hmm as well because that's really important if you come across as a team player you're going to be taken on as a team player so yeah okay yeah. that's great okay so we've got the one page cv with all the highly relevant information on it and um, we've chosen our dream repertoire <laughs> <laughs> what comes next oh presentation presentation again granny i could be teaching granny to suck eggs here but you would be surprised um dress for dress for the um for the audition be smart don't wear glasses because i can't see your eyes and that's why i want mm. to communicate you know all that communication comes to your eyes says us sitting here in glasses I know. <laughs> <laughs> um present yourself well no jeans good shoes i want to see good shoes <laughs> and also if you're going if you're going for a trouser roll as a mezzo or an or a contralto wear trousers you know, mm. present yourself in that way. If you're singing, you know, um, if you're singing Flay the Mouse or something like that, you know, you need to dress the part. If you're, um, you know, if you're if you're going for Carabino, dress the part, you know. Mm. Um, if you're going for Count Orlovsky, dress the part, you know, the whole thing. Make what if you're doing, what if you're doing a trouser roll and a non-trouser roll? Okay, well, <laughs> you can come up for me before. <laughs> I would still, I would wear trousers. I would wear trousers, but I would wear, <laughs> I'd wear a more feminine top. Yeah. And having said this though, is that, I mean, I know that this is like, but is that gonna, is that gonna be the deciding factor? No, if like someone standing in a dress where singing um, Orlovsky. It makes a difference. You'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. One of my, I'm gonna name drop, one of my lovely mezzos that I have, um fixed for a number of things and also have sung messiah solos with is a lady called um, laura margaret smith she is fabulous fabulous such a character and she came in and i think she sang Wolofsky to in it for an audition and she just embodied it from the moment she walked in she had beautiful trousers on a white shirt um high heels obviously um and she came in and she just brought it to the table and it wasn't just what she was doing vocally it was how she was presenting herself how she was characterizing it and how and what she was wearing and then we've gone down the road and we've gone down to do the traditional messiah situation and we've been all in our long dresses and all that kind of stuff and she embodies a completely different space when she's doing those two different parts those different kinds of rep and it's the fact that she embodies it um, and, and goes for it full, full pelt, you know, and really commits. And it's not over characterization because yeah. in some auditions, you have people walking from one side to the other, forward and back. No, 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 stand still, stand still and bring it on this way. So moving on from that um, and the, and the, uh, the energy of, of this singer's performance and the characterization of this singer's performance, that's not to say that she was roaming around the audition room because a lot, again, a lot of people do. Again, mm -hmm. uh, sorry if this isn't you, but, <laughs> but uh, well, honestly, nerves take over quite a lot sometimes. And you'll find that a singer will move one way and move the other and move forward. And move. I don't want what I want you to do is to stand still, stand relaxed, and then give it to me from the voice, from the face, maybe your gesture. But I it's distracting otherwise. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm focusing on the sound, I'm focusing on on your characterization that doesn't need all this extremity. And it's nerves. 
Is it? I mean, when I used to get nervous, I used to conduct myself. <laughs> so I would stand there and I'd sing and I'd be doing this. <laughs> feeling the music with my body. <laughs> and I have to stay into this, otherwise it's not going to go well. You know, yeah. it's one of those things that you just need to relax because then your, your voice will flow better anyway. But it's so hard. And I totally understand being on other sides, being both sides of the coin is that sometimes you walk into an audition room and people just barely look at you. The, 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 you know, the panel will just kind of grunt as you walk past. That's hard to deal with. Luckily, you'll have come across people like myself and my colleagues, anyone who's auditioned for myself and certain other people before, is that I want to make the situation as comfortable as possible because otherwise I won't hear you at your best. So mm. I'm smiling, I'm welcoming, I, I'm, I want to hear you. I want you to know that I want to hear you. It doesn't matter if you don't get the job. It just means that in that moment, you're going to feel really comfortable. So being on the other side of that, facing someone who's just like not even looking at you, sometimes, and I've had this on their phones, mm. um, <laughs> um, you have to rise above that, okay? And you have to take that as a right, I'm going to wake you up with what I've got you know yeah go in there smile present yourself well and make them pay attention because some you know these people we hear hundreds of singers hundreds of singers but it's our job as panelists to not allow that to affect the people walking into our room that's how I feel anyway I feel that if you're mm -hmm. walking into this room to sing to me and it's the same when it's a, a singing competition whenever I adjudicate I want you to feel that I want to hear you and I'm interested and I'm engaged, you know. Um, and if you're not getting that, it's very difficult. It's yeah. very difficult as a performer. So you have to kind of train yourself to expect that that's a situation. I mean, I know certain opera companies that people will sing three or four lines and they'll ring a bell and then they're out and that's it. Next. It's not what it's not massively respectful to people as, as yeah. artists and humans, is it? So I, I think I often think this is the main difference between obviously performing and auditioning um, or taking part in competitions um, and to some extent recording as well, which is that in a concert hall with an audience in general, the vibe is very much we're all here to see you and we want you to do well and we all want to have a lovely time together. Um, yeah. And in other in those other circumstances, it can be um, it can be not that. And I think you're right. There's, there is two, there are two sides to it. if you're able to stay very focused in your sense of your own quality and mm. give that to the panel regardless of how they're behaving towards you then that's definitely an asset um mm. and a useful thing to be able to do but I do I mean I personally do think that's very hard and yeah. I'm someone who absorbs a, the feeling in a room big time so if someone comes in like looks at me and is like mm. Yeah. Um, and I know I remember doing grade exams and knowing that the sort of big bit or the coloratura bit or whatever was coming up and being like they're not looking you know in my head I'd be like you know and it's like in some ways you have to be able to switch yourself off I, mean, I think yeah. from what you're doing as well because if you're actually like oh god they're not looking at me and I just did the big bit what does this mean yeah. and then that's going to get in the way and also to be prepared for anything I've had personal situations where um, I've been to a two or three tier, uh, audition stage and I've got through the first stage and I've said okay so and you prepared three arias so and they've made you sing two in the first section so you sung your first two and you're like oh great brilliant I got through fantastic and then you ask someone for advice and you say so what happens in this next round then oh you'll just have to sing those two arias again run them through with your new pianist sing them through that's great fine ready and then they will turn around and ask for the, the other aria and that yeah. before and that other aria was a very trick, a tricky aria a very tricky handle aria that I had then not rehearsed with my pianist and then I was really thrown in the audition and something yeah. that I'd really worked hard on and had really perfected all this high coloratura all these top C's and this kind of stuff I was there I threw it completely and I was so angry not just with myself but with um with the person on the staff who told me that you'll just sing mm. the song to again that's okay be ready for anything don't believe, mm. don't believe what they say you know <laughs> don't believe it. But, you know they might say i only want to hear this oh actually hang on a minute have you got any handle or have you got any puccini or you know? i've heard of this happening as well someone um 
yeah, I got asked for something completely, utterly different, not on the list at all. I can't remember what the audition was for now. I was just like, she was telling me about it afterwards and I was like, <gasps> yeah. And it was thrown yeah. off my confidence that I never went back to audition for that, for that group again and that situation mm. again. And I forever mm. kick myself for it because mm. I, I was 23. And at mm. that age, if you're not, you, you know, if you're a sensitive human being like me, if that, that is a scary situation to put yourself back into. And mm. it's the same nowadays, especially with younger, not, so there might be some younger people have the most amazing instruments that if they get turned down for one thing, they won't go back. The only mm. thing is that you may not have the right voice for that right situation right now go back go back until they're sick of you <laughs> keep going keep showing them your progress and then you know let them assess you as you go along but show them that you're making progress as I say I kick myself every day for that luckily mm. I've done well on others on, in other ways um but the what if still sometimes sits in the back of your mind so don't don't give up if people say no say right well maybe next time and I'll carry on giving you new rep showing you how I work showing you what I'm improving at showing you that I'm gaining confidence and, and it's, it's, it's really hard isn't it because all of this is being done you know there is no kind of career progression like you go for this and then you go for this and then you go for that you're having to make all these decisions yourself as a singer mm -hmm. hopefully with the advice of good coaches and a good teacher and but still you know um it's really hard to have have that and that's why I hope this episode is really useful for people because and I wondered if it would be good now to move on to the uh, the kind of audition horror story section <laughs> or perhaps the things that it's worth being being prepared for because I and it might be worth thinking a bit about um about college auditions and stuff like this in in this as well because I know um you know the ones that I can think of you mentioned before running things through with a pianist that's not always a given no. sometimes you get flung in there without that you know so look, I mean you know you'll have a better sense of what we should be talking about than me but it's this kind of like total what are you going to get on the day yeah so if that's the situation, um, if that's the situation and you haven't got that with a pianist which is often the case you need to be very clear with what you want from that pianist, that company stairs to accompany you. If you don't give them the, the guidance, they might run off at the wrong tempo, you know, and often there's, you know, some people who kind of, some pianists who feel that like a certain aria should go a certain way, and that might not be the way that you want to do it. So you have to be very, very prescriptive. Talk to them beforehand, run them through it. Oh, for goodness sakes, I know this is a really, really simple thing, but if you're handing people photocopies, stick them together. Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave a pianist with an awful page to her job. <laughs> that doesn't do anyone any favour. simple thing, but have sellotape in your bag <laughs> and do it. Do it, you know. That shows a lot more. Not those plastic slidey folders either. They are hated, yeah. hated by your digital. Yeah, because the light reflects on them <laughs> and they and they fall off. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Annotate your music. Annotate it really clearly so you can show this person exactly what you want where. Go through mm -hmm. repeats, go through cuts, go through if you're gonna do the da capo, tell them that you are going to be doing a fantastic cadenza at this point and you really need to be waited for <laughs> so there's not a clang before you finished just yeah. make sure that you're giving yourself every single safety net you can to be able to for you to not worry about that and just focus on your performance yeah absolutely because in most cases um for professional auditions the, the um, pianist will be enormously um competent and, and knowledgeable so mm -hmm. we'll have ideas and we'll be able to support you um with it but yeah it definitely helps if they know what you want because otherwise they will obviously they'll sort of make a best guess yeah um, yeah. yeah I mean yeah. one of the things that people I know this is this you might want to slot this in somewhere else but one of the things that a lot of people fall down on is not bringing the right languages and not making sure that they've had coaching on those languages because yeah. um if you're not singing in say really good clear German or really good clear French it's going to shoot you down straight away. It doesn't matter yeah. what noise you make. Um, and that's, again, it's another thing. Sometimes it doesn't matter what noise you make. It actually mm. matters how you present yourself 
and how you engage. Sometimes I've employed singers that weren't quite as standard as other singers because they had the right attitude, they came in and gave the right vibe, they had good languages, but not such a great voice, um, but also came across as really good musicians. Now, you can be a great musician without a great voice. You know, you can have an, a kind of like a usable voice, a, a usable voice, um, but be the best musician ever mm. you over a fantastic voice and someone who really wasn't a very, didn't have very good musicianship. Um, mm. organization. So, you know, it's not, it isn't just the noise you make, some, it is how you deliver yourself as well. <laughs> yeah, so that like, that mishmash of priorities that, that the singers had to think about in choosing their repertoire, then the panelists then have this sort of similar mishmash of priorities in terms of, of get, who to give the jobs to. And I think this is the other thing that, you know, that's just so important to do with rejections, isn't it? Because they are just so um, much of a part of, of a singer's career. And it is, and I'm always saying to people, it's not, it is just not being right for that job at that time. And it's not, but it's so hard not to take it as a personal kind of like, you know, my voice just isn't good enough for this situation or this, that and the other. And again, I think that I do just think the whole thing takes such enormous kind of strength of character yeah. <laughs> and, and um, uh, you know, I, mean, I, have a, I have a real issue with um, music colleges. I'm going to get shot down for this, but I have a real issue with music colleges taking on students who really don't have the capacity to have a career out of it. You know, I find I find that really difficult. And it's often, and I hate to say this, it's a financial thing. Um, and that's really sad because if these 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 people aren't haven't really got the initial kind of spark or sparkle, mm. then it's gonna end up in a really negative situation because you know, when I was asked when I went to I went to junior guild hall and we had this lecture and it stuck with me hugely. And the lecture was, how many asked, how many of you do you think will ever teach in your life or want to teach? And no one put their hands up. And they said, here's a, here's a reality check. Every single one of you will have to teach at some point in your career. And it's having that kind of that realism about what you're trying to achieve. It's, it, there's something to do with responsibility for what people are being put through to get to a certain stage, isn't there? So I think what I have, I struggle with the idea of co people coming out of, um, of like a university level education and having no idea what they're letting themselves in for mentally, emotionally, um, financially, and so on. And, you know, I actually believe that music colleges are doing a lot more now than they ever have done to prepare people for the entrepreneurial side Absolutely. of the business. I totally agree. And the thing is, a lot of people have missed out on that. Mm. Um, and um, it's a really important part of the work balance, work life balance. Mm. Um, and it's also understanding, like, especially for women, if you're going to go out and have a baby, you have a baby, you're going to have a big chunk out, you're going to have to reassess and, re and reapply and kind of almost a lot of times start a bit further back than you were because the nature of the yeah. baby is these kids coming out of college and they're amazing. So you might in that period, whilst you want to have, if you want to be at home with your children, you're going to have to reassess what jobs you can take and what jobs mm -hmm. you can for. For example, um, when I had my babies, I was lucky enough to be able to take them off with me for seven weeks to go and do my course managing and, managing and singing. I had a lot of support. Now, the boys are seven and 10, and um, right at this moment in time, it's not right for me to take long contracts. Um, I have done long contracts in the past, you know, Paris and, and Wexford and all that kind of stuff. I've done long contracts and long tours, but right now it's not right because I have to be a mummy. That doesn't mean I don't want to be a singer and that doesn't mean I don't want to be on panels and it doesn't mean that I don't want to be auditioning people. It doesn't mean that I don't want to be auditioning and performing. And more to the point, it doesn't mean that you have lost any of those things oh, that you yeah. had that meant that you were doing long contracts. Yeah. I'm singing the best I ever have at the moment, you know? Just yeah. before COVID, I was like at the top of my game, which is great. And, and, and hopefully I'm still there. So I'm feeling very confident vocally at the moment. Um, 
but I just have to reassess what I do. And what I'm very lucky that I can do is I can also, I can perform and I can sing at a high level, but I also have a come and sing company and I have some coaching and I have some consultation work as well. Mm. So I can then have all these elements that mean that I can actually still make a decent living because I have to be honest with you, unless you're touring 24 seven or you're, um, or you're, on contract to an opera house the whole time, you're not going to be a millionaire. <laughs> you know, you're not going to make a lot of money. You have to be in it because you love it and you want to do it. Um, and as you get older, and it is something to address, you know, as you get older, you do have to reassess how you're doing things. And also as you get older, you have to reassess the roles that you want to apply for and the companies that you want to apply for. Um, and that's something that, again, it's another thing to consider, you know, I won't be singing Zerlinas anymore, I won't be singing Zervanettas anymore, but I may be singing a Countess, or I might even get a Dido now, which I wouldn't have done before I had my babies, you know, mm. all that kind of rejig, but you also have to value yourself enough to know that you are good enough at whatever point you are in your career. And, and you have that support and you're good enough to be able to kind of go, yeah, I'll do that gig. They won't forget about me. And then I'll do my yeah. job and they'll do that gig. But they won't forget about me because, you know, I've done a good job. Yeah. And then keeping kind of keeping the things going underneath that also, again, it surprised me, give me so much joy. So I get I do a lot of work with special educational needs schools and children. Um, very severely kind of neurodivergent children as well as kind of all my other bits and that gives me so much joy and happiness and I still get to sing and I still get to give something back um, but it's in a different way so don't think just because that role hasn't come your way or you've failed on a few auditions or it's not coming to fruition the way that you want it to that that's it because it's not you know there's other things and there's other times and there's other rep and there's other teachers if you feel like you're not getting what you need um, and there's other companies there's hundreds of opera companies around the world that you might have exactly what they want and hundreds of consorts as well mm. so it's kind of embracing all of that does that make sense I mean it's yeah it is it's like so you, having this ability to kind of it feels to me like having this real core sense of your own value as as a as a musician, as a singer, as a, as a professional person in whatever capacity that is, and being able to zone out of it enough and say, this is my career right now, but it's not my career forever, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, mm -hmm. you know, it's always good. I always advocate for looking to the future. Yeah. Often when things are going well, it's the best time to do that as well. Because yeah. the thing about singers is, is that, um, as you say, those roles move through, you, you know, as you get older, the roles that you're going for change. And that means that you have to be constantly evolving because, mm -hmm. Um, you know, if you've had a career break or, or, you know, a pause in taking long contracts because you've had children and then you go back into it and say, right, I'm now going to leave those young girls behind. That's been quite a defining moment. But for some people, they don't have that. So it's kind of like, where do you draw the line? Yeah. Um, but the, and just to come back to uh, the reason that I say this a lot, but the reason why I think this is particularly difficult for musicians to do is that usually in education right the way through to very high level education it is an industry or, or like a practice that is all based around learning from masters so you there is a, a the master pupil relationship mm -hmm. is strong so it's just kind of like you get sort of qualified for stuff through um somebody saying that you're good enough yeah. and so rather than through actually you know any kind of meaningful hierarchy if that makes sense mm -hmm. Not that, not that I think that that should be there, but do you know what I mean? So most va external validation literally comes from something, someone giving you a job or thinking that you're, you know, you know, a coach or a teacher saying, right, you're ready for this. And I think this is great and so on and so forth. So being able to move from being taught like that through to being able to make those kind of decisions for yourself. Mm. Yeah. Is, I, I think that is a real struggle for musicians. Often it's going from a small pond, uh, being a big fish in a small pond, to being a small mm -hmm. fish in a very big pond. And, you know, mm -hmm. the music industry at the moment, and especially vocally, we are all small fish in a big pond. That doesn't mean mm -hmm. we don't have our niche, and it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that we don't have something to offer 
Um, there's a lot of us out there. So if you can be one of those people who preps, who gets ready, who makes sure that everything is in order um, and present yourself well, then you're going to set yourself in good stead. You know, absolutely. But it's really important. So, yeah, that people get so stressed about what being the best actually means. And I'm not saying that any one thing is the answer to that, but there is a lot to be said for being the best that you can be across a whole range of things, including thinking about what you've worn, thinking about your repertoire, thinking about your presentation and your research, as well as everything else that, you know, what it's sort of like once you've done so much, you're then down to, if I don't get it, it's because it wasn't the right thing. Exactly, you can eliminate all of those what ifs. And I think it's also, you know, when you look at COVID, there's been no uh, music making in opera houses for over 18 months, you know? And in those 18 months, I know that some some of my singer friends have struggled to find something to do within the industry that allows them to be musical, but not on stage. And I mm. think that's a really, really important point. That if there comes a point when there's another pandemic or situation where you can't perform for some reason, or the opera houses can't perform, make sure that you're invested in some other area of the musical business that allows you to continue that passion through a different angle. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I've been making music throughout COVID just in a different way. And it's kept me sane. <laughs> it's kept me sane, you know? Yeah. So yes, your, product, your talent is your voice, but also your talent is your musicality and your understanding and administration skills you know you need to have these administration skills you're a freelance self-employed person you need to have administration skills you know your communication skills all of these things are really vital to you as a as a singer and as a performer and if you can utilize those outside of that performance bracket then you're going to give yourself a safety net um to know that you've got something that you can fall back on um if horrific if i hope to god they don't happen again but this kind of situation Mm. does happen again yeah absolutely oh thank you so much for uh for talking us through all this i hope that's been super useful i've really enjoyed it it's it's in many ways just good to know that um well, certainly remembering back to my experience of auditioning for college and for opera chorus when I was a, when I was a lot younger, um, mm. just knowing that everyone else doesn't know how auditions work and I'm the only one that doesn't is, is a nice thing. <laughs> they're, all so, they're all so varied. But if you go into that situation, that knowing that you've got everything in order and you've yeah. done your research and you know what they want, the only thing that can go wrong is that they don't want you for that role. Yeah. Yeah. Else. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Ellie. As a singer myself, I can say how helpful and fascinating it has been to hear you share your insights on an aspect of a singer's career that doesn't get the kind of attention that actual performing does, um, but which is such a core aspect of our professional lives. I know that I've learned a lot myself. So if you're interested in talking to us about working with Ellie, you can contact Polyphony Arts via our website at polyphonyarts.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Works podcast. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please subscribe, check out our other great episodes and even better, leave us a review. You can also sign up to our mailing list at www.polyphonyarts.com forward slash mailing dash list for updates and news about what Polyphony Arts is up to for all you classical music folk out there. You can find more information in the show notes as well. Meanwhile, I'm Katie Beardsworth and I look forward to sharing with you the next great episode of Music Works. Music Works is generously supported by Allianz Musical Insurance, the UK's number one musical instrument insurer. Allianz Music Insurance, serving the music community since 1960, proud to be the insurer of choice for over 70,000 musicians. Music Works is a Polyphony Arts production. Thank you for listening. Thank you.